All right, this is James Gillen with As You Wish Talk Radio. I've got Cheryl Gottschall, and uh, she's president of the UFO Research in Queensland. And uh, we're here in, in Brisbane right now. Also, I have Barry Taylor, and he's uh, with UFO Research Queensland. And we've got Peter Slattery here, which who I've been traveling with this whole time while I've been in, uh, on this long tour. We've been going up and down the coast here, doing a lot of lectures and talks and uh, and uh, meeting wonderful people like Barry and Cheryl here along the way. So, uh, you know, getting a, a, a taste of Australia here and what's uh, what's happening. I should say Australia, you don't say Australia <laughs> here. You say, you say, G'day Australia. <laughs> but uh, anyway, without any further ado, I wanted to talk, um, I'll go with Barry first. Uh, you, you've been in this field, how long have you been in this field? You've been in quite some time, haven't uh, you? Well, 1970, I had my first UFO close encounter when living in Sydney, and uh -huh. uh, that's when my interest uh, in the subject sparked, and I started researching from there. So it's, it's been a long haul, but uh, the 1990s is when I videotaped a lot of UFOs, so I came back into the subject after a bit of a layoff. In yeah. Between. And I know you've got some pretty incredible footage that's, that's uh, been all around the world. All the news agencies have picked up on it. Yeah, I was fortunate enough to, um, in the early days, like in the 90s, video cameras were just becoming um, yeah. affordable to the public and uh, yeah. eight millimeter. So the quality is not as good as high definition these days, but I was fortunate enough to videotape a lot of daytime and nighttime activity. Mm -hmm. And uh, Cheryl, what got you into the field? Um, well, it was uh, in the 80s and um, I was doing a home Bible study course and I'd done that for three years and I'd started to look at the scriptures in the Bible and the descriptions of angelic visitation. Mm -hmm. And I started to think that they were more alike to uh, what I was reading about modern day close encounter reports. Mm -hmm. And I just sort of went from there. So I've come at it from a different angle. Yeah, yeah, it's funny. It's funny how they all, they all merge. You know? Yes, it's, it's isn't like, it? What I find out is uh, everything when you do the research, you know, if you go at it through a religious process or an investigative process and, and uh, even all the old uh, spiritual techniques, um, yoga, everything, everything goes back to the stars. If yeah. you go far enough back, yeah. it goes back to the stars. Yeah. We, we do a practice called Yigong and we were tracing it back and we, we, it went back to, to um, Tibet and China and, and then goes back to Atlantis and Lemuria actually yeah, <laughs> which yeah. which are from the stars you know mm. it's a Palladian colony so it's funny all these things they, they everything ends up back at the stars it mm. seems like the the image of the bearded god you know came from the Anunnaki and, and you know it all goes to advanced civilizations but uh, there's uh, what uh, I'd say what was probably uh, your most significant encounter or experience either one of you want to yeah, um, in uh, 91, I think it was, I uh, woke in the early hours of the morning uh, and I saw three small greys standing behind, beside the bed, mm -hmm. what we call grey aliens. They were about three and a half feet tall, um, they had the uh, inverted pear-shaped head, very, very skinny, mm -hmm. they actually had a skinny neck, quite emaciated looking, yeah. um, and they were just staring at me. And I went, wow, what, what have I woken yeah. up to? You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. What? And I was really terror struck. I was, I was um, completely terror struck. And I, had, I knew people who'd used that term, but it wasn't until I had that experience myself that I actually understood it. You know? mm -hmm. um, because I think I was seeing something that was so alien to what I understood and what was in my um, reality. And then I did what any normal person would do. <laughs> I pulled the sheet up over my head and I started praying. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the next thing I know, it was morning. Yeah. And I didn't have the memory until later that afternoon, and it just sort of flooded back into my mm -hmm. mind. And I, and I thought, wow, <laughs> what happened there? <laughs> you know, <laughs> because people don't ordinarily go yeah, to sleep when yeah. they're terror struck. You know. Yeah. Well, I always said sheets are highly overrated. As far as protection, <laughs> I know. <laughs> but, yeah. I know. but we seem to grab them every time. I know. <laughs> I've heard of other people doing it too. <laughs> no, yeah, That's exactly. one time you went when you want to be in the dark. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, Barry, do you have any, uh, 
had some. You've probably had some amazing encounters. Uh, I can't say I've ever seen greys or <laughs> reptilians or, you know, like uh, what I would call an alien, unless it's human-like. Mm-hmm. I've had a couple of encounters when I was living in North New South Wales with human-type people who are considered to be aliens because <laughs> of certain characteristics about them and, and uh, just their behaviour. Um, but my main experience with the UFOs has been um, actually seeing the craft, uh, having them buzz me and mm-hmm. low overhead and some sort of communication with them by being aware of one another. Um, for example, uh, a, a close formation of um, V formation of seven golden discs 40 foot above me right. and, and doing, doing probably 60 mile an hour very very slowly and I was, had a video camera in my hand but in my mind I heard don't video them just look at them and observe every detail you can and which is what I did so I had a great look almost you could see into them mm-hmm. I, I say you could put your hand into it and not touch anything solid it was that type of um, yeah. very very unusual and it had a grey, grey, bluey grey part at the front of the object. All these seven objects were identical, and I thought that's the brain of the thing, whatever mm-hmm. it is. And I then thought maybe it's lights underneath a single object. But when it went away, it was uh, tilted up at the front like this, and I was able to see the top, and it was identical. So that indicated to me there were seven individual objects, and each one surrounded by a um, uh, corona of. Um, ionized air Mm -hmm. and um, absolutely silent Mm -hmm. and uh, that was my closest amazing encounter (laughs) encounter. uh, as far as aliens now I've awoken with uh, strange scratches uh, and I've had some amazing dreams what I call dreams where I've been taken into other planets and it's like an education rather than anything else Mm -hmm. it's um, informing me of other things in space and other planets and I've seen ancient I've seen a lot in my dream. I call them dreams. <coughs> Other people might yeah. call them abductions. I'm, I'm not sure, but um, I've had mm-hmm. one account of sleep paralysis and didn't see any aliens around me, but that was pretty amazing to try and break out of that. Mm-hmm. Like, I've got to break bones. If I, I'm going to yeah. try and get out of this. You know, it was, it was pretty strong, but um, mm-hmm. that was a time of UFO activity, high activity. Yeah, it's pretty intense. <coughs> Peter, if you have anything to share, I mean, you've had some experiences as well here in, in Australia. Yeah, oh, I wouldn't even know where to start, but I guess, I don't know, it just continues, like even with, since you've been here, we've had, you know, crafts come down really low, um, at Mount Buffalo, that's sort of one of the most recent things that we've had, had down low, but um, pretty, you know, similar to yourself, being on the crafts, seeing different types of beings, um, yeah, but it seems to be like the, there's so much activity in Australia, uh, is there, as there is around the world, but a lot of it's concentrated, I think, on the eastern seaboard, just for the fact that the population's here, and I reckon there's just as much activity everywhere else, almost by how much the population is there, I think, is it noticed. Yeah. So we went out to Uluru, and, yeah. and people say, um, what is the, the hot spot above Uluru there? Um, they call it Australia's UFO, Wycliffe Wells, but, you know, I know people that go there and they haven't seen things <laughs> in their yeah. experiences, but then some people have, but... There's, there seems to be a concentration of activity, especially up here in Queensland, on the on the east coast, mm-hmm. from from the research that I've done. Whether you know it was little crop circles or you know, um, interesting stories of seeing beings and that sort of thing. So, what do you reckon? Do you what's some of the popular stories up here in Queensland, like that would be good for James and I guess the the listeners around the world that would interest them. I guess you know. Um, well, there's the classic case of Tully, which occurred in, I think it was 66, mm-hmm. um, which is in uh, North Queensland on the coast. And um, it involved a farmer and his neighbour, but uh, uh, one of them saw, um, they saw a disc. I can't quite remember the details. It's been a while since I've looked at that case. They but saw a disc come up. They saw a disc, yeah. yes. Uh, and the water and, and lagoon actually was swirling and then they came back later and a um, compressed mat of reeds which were floated to the top and it was about that that thick and you could actually sit on it and you could go underneath it they'd been completely pulled out from mm-hmm. under the lagoon uh, and um, that was a, a very well known case um, but in recent times gosh we've had so many 
so many different types of reports that people have been telling me yeah. about because I have the, um, the contact number of our organisation. And recently I contacted various um, media through um, the rural um, parts of Queensland and I had some reports that came in that went back 50 years and people had never uh, reported those things. And they were things like um, seeing craft very close, giving good descriptions, you know, those sorts of yeah. things. Um, and you get that all around the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the one where the UFO went through the buildings on the Gold Coast. Oh yes, that was an interesting one. It was um, from two gentlemen who were standing outside the Twin Towns Club on a place called the Tweed uh, in uh, northern New South Wales in Australia. And this was in 96 or 7 I think it was and they saw this large, very large object come in over the water and it was in within about 50 metres of the water surface and I think it was about 100 metres out or something like that. And they watched it and the surface of it was uh, changing. It was like um, uh, a smoky crystal but it was moving mm -hmm. and uh, it hung there for a while for them to get a good long look at it and, uh, and then it took off. But when it took off <laughs> The guy said it yeah. just cut through the buildings like butter. So wow. it was like solid materials had no meaning for them. You know, they obviously understood physics beyond our comprehension. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And they just cut right through the buildings as if they weren't even there. <laughs> yeah. We have that at the mountain a lot. They, the ships will go right. You know, you'll see a, a light disc coming into the mountain and all of a sudden they just phase out right before they hit. And you're waiting to hear a crash. Mm -hmm. and nothing happens and I think they just phase out and then phase back in mm -hmm. on the inside and they can travel right through uh, solid ob objects or, or do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. And for the, I guess the lesser evolved ships, they have a door on the mountain. They, they open the door for those guys to come in. You know, <laughs> we have footage of that, film yeah. of the door opening and mm -hmm. things like that. Yeah, I, I filmed an interesting one, daytime ones, was about um, 300 metres from me. 300 yards or whatever and um, on the video you can see it was like an upright cylinder at low altitude and um, it, you can see on the video it sort of fades out to totally disappear and then it comes back up again and then takes off yeah mm. very rapidly so mm. it, it's just caught on the video it, it went into a whatever another dimension or whatever and then uh -huh. come back again and then took off they seem to I've seen that happen before with the with the cylinder ones is that right before they take off they mm. They'll phase out and then phase back in and pop and they're gone, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, which is interesting. There was another case too, very interesting, where a woman came upon a scene and there was traffic, people walking, cyclists, etc. But they were all frozen, oh, wow. frozen in time. Yeah. And uh, she, she, uh, she was, it was like she was out of the radius of that um, area that was frozen and controlled because she looked over and she saw a, uh, a typical dome-shaped craft and it was close enough, it was hanging over the river behind the scene she was looking at and uh, she could actually see, there were windows and she could see two beings through the mm. windows who had what she said were inverted triangular shaped heads yeah. and then she sort of, she stepped out and maybe um, something changed anyway and the UFO it started to sparkle underneath mm -hmm. and then it took off up the river and it wasn't until it was out of range that everything switched back on. Like, yeah. you know, people started yeah. walking, talking, oh, vehicles, etc. Yeah. And she rushed over to someone and she said, did you see that, did you see that? And they said, what? So no time had yeah. changed for them. But she, that it had been frozen. Was Sounds it like there? maybe the mantis beans or something, or I the triangle know. head, I wonder what they saw. I don't know. Yeah, there's a, a lot of accounts of that. I, I know I was talking, one time I was actually walking and I and I was my leg was up in the air and they actually took me like half half stride mm -hmm. and then brought me back and then when I took the next step I kind of stumbled a little bit mm. like what happened you know what mm. was that and then I found out later I was gone for like two weeks mm. wow. that they took me and they were showing and I have full memory of, of going to this school and I was teaching, pe talking to people about earth and, yes. and it's a rough go down here and things yeah. like this. I was preparing these, this younger group for coming in, I was preparing mm. them and then 
the next thing you know, I'm back and, and I didn't even miss a half a step. Yeah, mm. so amazing. So it's, it amazing. it's pretty amazing the technology they have and what they can do. And mm. you know, a lot of people think you know you have to come and open a door and pick you up and carry you mm. out the sack, you know, for an abduction yeah. or something, or to go up on the ships, but. They can just pop you right in and out you yes. know, and, and put you back and you wouldn't even know anything yeah. happened. Well, there was another report I received recently about that was a woman who was uh, meeting her friend on her at her friend's property in, in central Queensland and the woman had actually was flying, uh, flying a light plane there to meet her. Mm -hmm. And the uh, a few other friends and family gathered and they hadn't seen each other for a while and the woman who was flying the plane didn't turn up. And so it, um, search and rescue went out looking for her. She was missing for two days. Mm -hmm. And she eventually turned up in her plane and no one was there and she thought, what's going on? And they, she had been missing for two days and no one can explain why. Yeah. In a plane. <coughs> yeah, you can't fly for two days. No. No, I mean, not in a plane like that. You no. be going down somewhere. Mm. Yeah, I've heard of stories about that, you know, where there's a lot of missing time and Especially around the Bermuda Triangle, that happens quite often, mm -hmm. you know, where people pop in and out. And uh, there's a story, I guess, of a, a, a little Piper Cub plane that, you know, people were watching it flying and all of a sudden it, there was a little blue space in front of it and it flew into it and it was gone. And they never, it's a woman pilot too and they yeah. never saw her. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, they don't know where she went. Mm -hmm. Snitched. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's been, um, I know there's been a lot of activity and I, I was totally amazed when I got here. The second night I got here, we walked out on, on Peter and Saul's deck, you know, and we had just big power-ups one after another and I go, it's like just standing at East Eddy in the field. Mm -hmm. You know, we're in the middle of town, you yeah. know, right in the middle mm -hmm. of town in Melbourne. So it's it's pretty amazing, the activity. Would, would you say, that, you know, there seems to be a common thing. It seems like, I always wonder, you know, if... I don't think it's random that they select people. I think people incarnate to do this kind of work and, and they have connections to these beings. Would you say overall that's kind of of, uh, of what's going on? Um, look, I can't say that for sure. Yeah. But my interest for since about 2000 has been in um, trying to find the people who have close encounters rather than waiting mm -hmm. for us to, to yeah. be contacted by them, I've wanted to find them. So I thought, well, how would I go about that? So I started studying the, the people, their personalities, profiling them, basically. Yeah. Uh -huh. So what I have found is that people who report close encounters or multiple UFO sightings in their life is typically they're highly creative people. They're often musicians, which is like Peter, mm -hmm. and he's a very creative person, uh, and so is Sol Rita. Yeah. And um, they're um, often uh, less materialistic, uh, have a concern about the environment or they're socially conscious. Um, all that gets activated as well as uh, their ESP abilities mm -hmm. like precognition and yeah. being sensitive to, to um, non-physical beings around them, those sorts of things. Or, and or they develop a, an interest in um, the healing field Mm -hmm. as well, whether it's traditional or, or um, alternative or complementary therapies. Um, so, and there's more, but that's basically what yeah. I've found. Yeah. So, it seems that extraterrestrial contact is being made with people who perhaps use more of their right brain faculties. Mm -hmm. uh, and it may have something to do with telepathic communication. I, I don't know whether that uses the right brain. Um, or... Um, uh, I don't know really, I really don't know, mm -hmm. but people certainly change after their experiences mm -hmm. yeah. and all of that is magnified or activated. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I've had a lifetime experience with UFOs, I saw my first UFO as a 10 year old and um, I've always had an interest in space and the night sky which I used to lay out on the lawn as a child so mm -hmm. it's something that I've been brought up with and even in the 60s I saw UFOs in Sydney and I've seen them in the 70s and photographed them in the, when I was in the Blue Mountains in the 70s and um, then in the 90s just was full on with, uh, I went through not only waves of UFOs but a, uh, two or three uh, flap situations where there was UFOs every 20 minutes yeah. or so yeah. and um, so I, I, I've, I've discovered that uh, if you can make them aware that you're aware of them they'll become aware of you and then they'll, mm -hmm. they'll follow you 
they'll, they'll show up at the most unlikely places. I've, yeah, been, yeah. I've been at other places in New South Wales and the same objects are in the daytime sky and they'll come around a tree that I was behind to take a better look at me uh -huh. you know, and then shoot straight up. And as Pete probably knows with himself, you know, if you're out there sky watching, become known that you're that these aware of these things, they become aware of you, yeah. and that's when it can all really happen for you. Mm. It's kind of like the chicken or the egg story, you know, what came mm. first? Because I always wondered that: where do they choose people that are more spiritually awake or or gifted, or or does that happen after the contact? It seems mm. like. Mm -hmm. And uh, and what I found out from other research is that they like to choose people, even in the abduction scenarios and and the contacts. And, you know, I don't like the word abduction; it sounds pretty mm -hmm. nasty, you know, in a way nasty. Mm -hmm. But I know some of that did go on. But uh, you know, they they're looking for the DNA of people that are uh, gifted, that do have uh, higher awareness, you might say, or, or more abilities, because. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's true about they're trying to upgrade their genetics and, and they made a wrong turn in history and they, they just went into knowledge and that's why they have the big heads and the little necks and bodies. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they, they took a wrong turn in, in uh, their evolutionary process and bred emotions out of their race. And so uh, in doing so, they would pick people that were very spiritual, very emotional, that, that were mm -hmm. in touch with their uh, the higher facility, faculties, mm -hmm. you might say. But... Uh, I yeah. think that, that might, they, it's latent in those people, even if it's not switched on. Yeah. But it certainly gets switched on after their experiences. Exactly. Now, whether yeah. that's because it's an, um, mm -hmm. uh, an effect that is happens to humans collectively when they have an, any sort of strange experience, mm -hmm. because those faculties that get switch, switched on also happen for people who have near-death experiences, yeah. which yeah. you've had as well, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. And I, actually, I have too. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so... Yeah, it's it's like you said, chicken or the egg. But I think maybe there's a predisposition in certain people mm -hmm. for that to be switched. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of interesting because you, you, it seems to be happening both ways, and, and it's hard to nail down exactly how. I work with a, a biophysicist, a German biophysicist, and this guy's incredible. He could actually clone a human you know, if he wanted to. Really? <laughs> but uh, he talks a lot about genetics, and and he talks about how. They can be switched on just with higher consciousness and energy. They, the, uh, they, they did a lot of testing on monks and people that meditated regularly and found out they had more codons activated mm. and things like that. Mm. So by doing spiritual practices, your DNA can, you know, the latent DNA they call mm. junk DNA. It isn't mm. junk. It's just not mm. switched on. Mm. Can, will start switching on and. Uh, and I think if you were subject to a, a burst of energy, like a real burst of higher consciousness and energy, you're automatically your body would start resonating to that, or you'd start mm. switching on the mm. on the DNA, which which makes makes mm. total sense to me. I I found you know I, I worked with um, uh, there's Dr. Emoto over there in uh, Japan, and the next guy in line is Dr. Nimoto. He's taken over the whole thing, and I was walking doing uh, some work with him and he was explaining to me that his research now is going into water, that water actually holds DNA, the, mm -hmm. the pattern for DNA, you can put it, it'll transfer into water and you also transfer it with a laser from one egg to another which they've proven they take a, a frog egg, shoot a laser through it into a salamander egg and the salamander will become a frog or vice versa, you know, mm -hmm. so they found that it's transferable. So. I think if you kick up the energy and then send it, it's, it's going to take over. It seems to be dominant. And I thought about that when he was telling me. I said, wow, that gives me a whole new mm. vision on the Immaculate Conception, mm. on the tinkering mm. that's been going on, how people have been upgraded. Yeah. Uh, and that's what I see. There's a whole lot of upgrading going on. And I think there's a plan that is so huge, it's so big, that's, mm. under, that's happening right now. And there's so many people that have been upgraded mm. uh, to be a part of this massive awakening and healing process or this big shift. Mm. That, that book you just explained, I, you could uh, see the planet from a distance with um, life on a laser beam. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Mm. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, when t technology catches up. Mm. I know we've been playing around with uh, Harold Oilfield's PIP technology and we had people come to the, the classes and the workshops and we had one guy that was really interesting and we'll put the pictures up on the site soon but probably after I get back but 
every time a new group would come in, the, the energy would totally change in the room. So if the platings came in, the whole room just whited out and everything went white. You know, if the, if the benevolent Anunnaki came in, the golden goddess type energy, the whole room turned gold, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and every time a different group came in, the energy changed. With the felines, it's green, you know. So it, it's really interesting. Uh, the guy, he's one of the top people here in Australia that knows how to use that technology. He was, I saw him, he was sitting there taking pictures, just mind is blowing. You know, and he goes, wow, this, everything you're saying is being documented right here in the film, in the camera, you know, mm. so I think it's great when technology starts catching up, you mm. know, to the, the spiritual teachings or wisdom. Mm. Mm. Is, uh, do you have anything to add, Peter, if you got to? No, like, it's, that technology is, um, it is fascinating, uh, what, what Harry's, did he invent it? I'm not sure, was it his invention, that technology? Well, I technology? think, I'm not sure, Harold... Oilfield is the guy that oh, I think it's well, Oldfield. 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 Yeah. Oldfield. Yeah. Oldfield is the guy that that it's it's attributed to whether or not he invented it or not or started using it differently. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know that's that. It's fascinating. I I'm really looking at getting a thermal type camera. I've seen a lot of stuff that's come through um, pretty full blown on a thermal camera. It's like there's it's given more depth. On the video and photos when you capture it, capture it with the thermo, so I'm looking to get that. But uh, that technology is, is pretty trippy to see, especially when I was there with you and he said, you know, you, you're saying what you're saying and it's coming up on camera. Yeah. So that's where this this guy, I think he was like the probably the top expert in Australia with this technology. He's been training for years and years mm -hmm. with it, and he said so many people can misread this that even the camera angle can make it look, you know like something that it really isn't so mm -hmm. he knew how to use that that technology but um going back to the craft things and that I've, like i've said to a lot of time uh times to a lot of people it's a lot of this is just not what people think in terms of um i, I was telling you guys yesterday how i've seen crafts come out of trees mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. when you're talking about the crafts going through the buildings mm -hmm. before um some people may be watching this if they're, they're new to the field going you know what the hell are these people <laughs> on or going on about, but I think it's great you 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 know that was brought up because it, a lot of my sightings have been of transparent type crafts, mm. though they've got a definite outline and you can still see somewhat um, markings, like not you know writing or anything. Though some may have that, but you know like outlines of ridges mm. and you know certain things on on the craft. So a lot of things that, that you know people are looking out to in this field, especially just having an open mind because mm -hmm. um, unless you experience it's hard to, mm -hmm. to perceive or take on board, but a lot of it's um, just not what people think, especially with the wispy stuff yeah, that yeah. I saw. I've yeah. seen wispy yeah. stuff walking around here the whole time and to everyone else might be like, what the hell is he on? But this is <laughs> yeah. where, I don't know how that works, whether it's vibration or tuning or, yeah. or, or yeah. whatever, but there's definitely the greater aspect of if the crafts can do that, well, obviously the occupants are doing mm. that. And whether they're using technology, I don't think they're using technology. I think some of the beings could use some technology to cloak themselves, mm. but um, for some reason, they're, them and the crafts are operating at the same mm. spectrum. And again, some of the crafts are created by thought, but how are they doing this? Yeah. And this is what it comes down to is what's interacting with this behind this, you know? Well, I, I, what I felt uh, with the observations during the 90s in particular, with a lot of the craft I, or objects I saw were um, almost translucent. Yes. And, yeah. and what, what I got from that was uh, dimensions. We got a third dimension, say, that's the, the boundaries of the third dimension. Mm -hmm. And then when you go into the next dimension, it slightly overlaps the third dimension. So yeah. you've got a barrier in there, yeah. uh, which is between two dimensions. And I think that's the barrier where the UFO flies mm -hmm. on, mm -hmm. on these occasions. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, par yeah. Partly... In, in the other dimension and partly in the 3D dimension. Yeah, yeah. And I've seen so many like that. Mm. And um, it's almost like you have a torch and you shine it in the, uh, uh, that's got flat batteries and you shine it in the sky and you've got this thin beam. Yeah. And then you take that b bit of beam out and that's your object. It looks something similar to that, you know. Yeah. But uh, while well, I can keep going with it, um, I feel mm. from my observation, particularly the daytime sightings like the fleet footage similar to Mexico, mm -hmm. Those objects are not craft with aliens in them. Mm -hmm. They're an alien space critter, a living life form within themselves. Mm -hmm. 
and I got that feeling with some of these UFO disc shaped objects as well. Yeah. Not a not a craft with alien beings because I've seen them in diameters like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think and and disc shaped like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and I felt that that object itself was a was a life form within itself. That that the object was the life form itself in that shape you know uh -huh. and that's a perfect shape for traveling space and all that sort of stuff mm. it is yeah and, yeah and i think that's a that should be considered as, is it a craft of beings or is it a life form mm. unknown life yeah, form itself? yeah because we have footage of these merkabahs which mm. are which are more of a spiritual form of transportation they're using it's just pure energy mm. but when you blow it up you can actually see a being in there mm. uh, you can see a being sitting mm. in there but to us, when I first filmed this one, it looked like an arc welding light. And it came in, it was just so bright, and I went, what is that? And then I could put the camera on it, and then it toned down a little bit, and then we filmed it coming over. Mm. And you could actually see it was like green on the outside, kind of pinkish, purple on the inside. And it looked like a bean was sitting there. Mm. And then sometimes it'll be in a lotus position or mm. things like that. It, it's really interesting. And I think that's the higher dimensional beings, you know, which it, it seems the higher dimensions can see all the way down through to the lower dimensions and can interact with the lower dimensions, but it's hard to go the other way mm, yeah. unless you mm. train yourself or you have some gift like clairvoyancy. Well, it's I interesting. Think, oh, sorry. Go no, on. I was going to say, I think it's difficult for us to be able to tell the difference between something that's um, perhaps what what some people might call a spiritual being yeah. and and a non-physical being mm -hmm. which could be very different because yeah. a non-physical being could actually be a being from a civilization that is just extremely advanced mm -hmm. uh, and they can use technology in ways that we have yet to think about yeah. and and because we haven't gone off world you know we're sort of in the dark here but perhaps it's because we haven't gone off world that we're um, uh, like human, we were talking about DNA before, the human yeah. DNA, oh, yeah. is actually a, um, quite pure. Mm -hmm. If you think about uh, extra, uh, civilizations that, um, extraterrestrial civilizations that have mixed their DNA with so many other civilizations over mm -hmm. millennia, yeah. right, um, and who knows what results you get from that. But it's oh, um, civilizations like ours that have yet to go off world where our DNA, I guess you could still say it's Earth DNA. Yeah. You know? So there there are good reasons for them to come here and take that, for example, you know, yeah. which we have no idea about. I heard a story that's really interesting. It's from my own spiritual connections and uh, about the Anunnaki and how they we have their DNA combined with the knuckle dragger that was here. Uh, but what happened is they kept jumping at the DNA and then they found out the, the demigods, which were which were the ones that had been jumped up, actually, you know, when, that's when the gods saw the women of man to be fair and took them as wives and things like that. Well, they, they created these demigods that were half human, half Anunnaki, and they actually excelled, so a lot of them excelled further than the Anunnaki because of the human, I don't know, there's something about the human genome, it's so strong, it, it's, it's, there's a lot of power and energy there. And, uh, and a good example was what they said was Noah, and when Noah was born, he was glowing, and he had white hair. And they go, what do we do with this kid? You know, it's like, and he was one of the sons of Enki, who mm. actually made it with an uh, uh, earth human. Mm. And, uh, and what happened is he excelled beyond uh, Enlil, which was the, the kind of the wrathful god, the warring god the, on, the, on that side of the, the ticket. But Enlil wasn't evolving at all because he still was doing the war thing and the general and all that stuff so he wasn't going anywhere he was very adept at, at war and, and strategy and everything else but he spiritually he wasn't evolving well what happened is Noah went past that and so a lot of the hybrids were going past the Anunnaki and, and uh, some were getting very upset about that you know? mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, hence the flood you know mm -hmm. <laughs> and some other things but uh, there's a lot more to that story. But it's interesting when you think about it. Sometimes uh, what I see in animals, especially dogs, the, the Heinz 57 dogs, you know, they, they seem to live longer. Mm -hmm. They, they uh, have less problems and less uh, hip displacements mm -hmm. and all those other things that, mm -hmm. that hit the purebreds. And, and a lot of them seem to be a lot smarter, too. Mm -hmm. So uh, there must be a lot to said, 
lot to be said with sometimes mixing DNA. You know? Yeah, mm. definitely stronger. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's what they were showing me too, is trying to, they're trying to take something back as well, some of these beings, and mix it with them because there's traits and abilities that we've got that they didn't expect or they want to, they want to glean from that yeah. as well, sort of that mixture. But going back for a sec uh, to what you were saying, Barry, I had similar information uh, expressed to me in terms of what you're saying with the the third dimension, the overlap. Mm. Yeah. And um, and it's interesting what you're saying is what I was showing, and I again is trying to interpret what information I get but it's what they'll show me is a interplane in between each plane in each dimension and it, as I said I'm starting to think there's like one with different vibrations but in between if we say dimensions in between each dimension the interplane is the same interplane in between each one it's mm-hmm. almost like a universal highway to go to the next plane you know to go to whatever vibration so just say you got three four five six they'll show me that in between each one is the same place mm-hmm. and that each dimension has different vibrations within it, if that makes sense. Mm. So you could be uh, 3D but really low, and then you could turn up higher, and it, something on the lower spectrum of it's not going to see it on the higher spectrum, if yeah. that makes sense. Mm. But it's funny because a lot of people are having these um, translucent, uh, transparent craft experiences. Like Ben Hansen, he's one that mm. I think he saw a, a triangle one, which I don't, I'm not sure if you feel that, but I think he had an experience with that. Um, I know a lot of people have seen these transparent crafts and this yeah. is where it goes on to you know it goes into the multi-dimensional aspect mm-hmm. and what you're saying about space critters um i i feel that a lot of uh what i'm saying up there is uh, not just et or or you know what people are thinking little green men nothing like that that i've seen but i'm thinking they're something that's always been there side by mm-hmm. side just wherever it is but there's some something i'll show you a little bit later too i've got something of about uh, 900 balls together. Mm. That's something the size of a 747. I haven't shown anyone yeah. yet. Mm-hmm. And this thing is living in it. Some would say it's an Ibani, but it's even something different from that, I yeah. think, mm-hmm. as well. I, I think an organic probe is not out of the question either. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, that can think and for themselves yeah. And, yeah. and transfer information and that because I've had um, oh, small objects like football shaped objects or slightly larger than football that have. I call them, they're UFOs, unidentified flying objects, yeah. and can fly that fast. They'll flash a light, but leave a streak in the sky. Uh-huh. And um, I had one that um, flew at a rooftop height 10 foot away from me, and it was moving so fast I couldn't pick it up with my eyes, but saw it in my peripheral vision, both sides coming and going, and I could hear that whoosh, as it went yeah. past. So it was disturbing the air, so it was in the third dimension, yeah, you know, it yeah. was there. But it was travelling, I estimated, 300 kilometres an hour, 10 foot away from me, and just had that... But it was... um, These particular objects were swooping me, coming around very closely, (laughs) because I made myself known to them that I was aware of them, you know? And uh, pretty amazing stuff. But what they... I've never heard them explained by anybody before, and... uh, So I I nicknamed them interceptors, because one would go down, another one would intercept it, and I saw this several times to prove to myself there's something happening there that yeah. I, I just to give them a name I call them interceptors but uh, that's another object that's um, I've, I've drawn sketches of it uh, I've seen them up close range and there's something there that's unexplained but uh, you know we, we saw yeah. some when we went to uh, New South Wales there a few weeks ago had a yeah. sky watch there one of them flew over there as well only small but uh, you make yourself known to them and they'll come around and check you out. Yeah, they made a, uh, uh, in my talk I show pictures of a, a light ship stepping down and when it steps down in frequency it becomes organic. Mm-hmm. And they told me that a lot of their ships are organic and there's a symbiotic relationship between the pilot, he's the only one that can fly that ship. And, uh, it, and they said that sometimes you have to be organic in order to transcend the dimensions that it's almost like an ascension process. We can take our organic body, raise it up in frequency, and jump through all these dimensions. Well, the metal ships can't do that. Some of them can't do that. And so there's something about being organic. And I had Dave Schrader out there with After Dark Radio, and we had this thing fly over, and it looked like a stingray. Mm -hmm. It looked just like a stingray. And the sides of it were undulating like this, Mm -hmm. and there was little lights. It was transparent, Mm -hmm. and it came right over us. And, and made a turn and then went off and, and Dave was Dave was uh, 
chasing after it, like throwing rocks at it and everything. <laughs> trying, trying to make it, he thought, he thought I had a camera up there with a hologram or something, you know, it's like people come up with stuff. And I, you know, I'm pretty technologically challenged, I'm sure as Peter can vouch for that. It's, it's computers, I'm just not, that's not my program. <laughs> But, uh, you know, people go, oh, one guy said, oh, is there a barn on the property? And at the time, there wasn't a barn on the property. And, and he said, if there's a barn on the property, you know, what he's doing is he's flying drones out of the barn and flying them over the group. And and, mm -hmm. uh, and so, so I said, well, actually, there isn't a barn on the property <laughs> because there wasn't at the time. We have one now. But uh, it's pretty funny, but the stuff that they that they try to come up with. Drives are pretty noisy too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, you'd you you'd hear it and see it and everything else, yeah. and and uh, but uh, I I just think it's funny how people we call them armchair yeah. investigators. They they don't go anywhere. They just sit in their armchair and they throw out assumptions mm. and as facts, you know. But they won't do any research. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. I, that happen a lot. I look at it as like a marine biologist that uh, has never put on a scuba gear and gone into the, say, the Barrier Reef and look at the wildlife there. And, yeah. You know how how you got to go into their environment. Mm. Yeah. So if, you won't see the UFO unless you go into their environment, which is outside. So uh, that's the first step of seeing UFOs for yourself. And uh, yeah. for those of us that mm. do the filming of the objects, that's what we have to do to do it. Mm -hmm. And the people that have never seen a UFO, they've got to make that move and go out to the environment, feel it around you, become aware, you know, expand your awareness for a start. That's good help. Yeah. And your and your vision, you know, like your, your train that all develops over time when you yeah. do it constantly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Especially if you're out in the bush, automatically you get out mm -hmm. in the bush, all of a sudden your senses start expanding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The more time you spend out in nature, the more your your senses start activating mm -hmm. and. And that's when you, it's easier to be aware of these things. Yeah, going on. it becomes natural. And sometimes you'll go out and it's just so quiet, you think nothing happening. Yeah. And you stay there as long as you want, but nothing will happen. Another time you walk out and the, the atmosphere is electrified. Yeah. Uh, it's on, you know, and it is. Uh -huh. That's UFOs, but then you have people who report seeing beings in their room and you don't have to go outside. Oh, no, no, no. no. <laughs> well, just turn up. <laughs> well, I, I, I didn't have to go outside to see a, a UFO one early one morning. It was in my room. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And, and it, it was going like this, just just beyond um, yeah. arm length. It was going like that, and I woke up. I could see it with a window in the background. I thought, oh, that's strange. I've never seen one move like that before. Not anything else, thinking, you know. Anyway, I watched it for about 20 seconds and it disappeared. And two weeks later, I videoed a daytime UFO that did exactly the, the exact same, same thing. thing. Yeah. Mm. yeah, they, uh, um, I was at the Global Science talk there and uh, in Colorado. And Colorado is like the, <coughs> the Queen's playground, basically. She has a big underground facility there and it's a very oh, third heavy, new, it? yeah, heavy new world order. They have a lot of crazy technology there. And this thing manifests in my room. It's about the size of a basketball, but it was loud. It was going clang, 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 clang when it was sitting there. It made this really loud noise. And I go, what kind of, what kind of technology is that? I mean, to, to have something making that much noise, mm -hmm. and it's supposed to be a stealth, like a little. It's probably uh, down 16 squillion miles. Yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I figured, I figured it was something that they, yeah, that they sent, that they sent to check me out or whatever. And, I was about ready to throw something at it, you know, <laughs> or just, to, and it disappeared, it just <coughs> vanished. Yeah, yeah. But I, I, it, what amazed me is, why would something that high-tech be so loud and, and mm. whatever mm. whatever technology they had was... Mm. was uh, Might be big to get your attention, maybe. Yeah, yeah. 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 Wake up a little bit. Yeah, yeah, don't talk, yeah. yeah. You sure you want to do this talk? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, being in Queensland, I've taken James to the Glasshouse Mountains. We're here in Brizzy now. Um, we've been to other other places as well, but what's your take and uh, what would you say the portal areas are if they, you know, if that's your take on it here in Queensland, like hot spots for activity? Mm. There's been, over the years, there's been different places. Um, up near Gympie, where they've done a lot of gold mining in mm -hmm. the past. Uh, which is um, about three to four hours north of uh, where we are at the moment. Um, there's also been the Brisbane Valley Highway, which goes west of where we are to Toowoomba. How far would that be? Um, right. But it's fairly flat because it, then it goes up into the ranges. So, and when you were talking before, I was thinking about um, the sound of UFOs, for mm -hmm. example, right? 
And there was one report some years ago where a woman was driving along and um, in the evening along the Brisbane Valley Highway, which wouldn't, in those days didn't have a lot of traffic at night, mm -hmm. and um, she was in an open convertible, so uh, she s was driving and she saw this large object ahead of her, and as she got closer, she could see it was a, a, a I think it was a dark grey coloured sort of um, ship of some description. Mm -hmm. And um, so she got so close and she said it was just moving very slowly but making a sound like a, a really good Rolls Royce engine. Oh, yeah. But, you know, but not so loud. But she could, said you could feel the power, mm -hmm. you know, and you could hear that beautiful sort of sound, smooth sound of, of that sort of engine. And it had a light beam coming out of it and it was going backwards and forwards like this across the road like it was looking for something. Mm -hmm. And she, obviously she stopped the car, pulled over, had a look of it, I, she was within about 50 metres of it, mm. and then she got the heck out of there. <laughs> um, yeah. But that's, that's another hot spot that we had there for a while, and also in northern New South Wales is Mount Warning as well, yeah. uh, which is an ancient Aboriginal mm. sacred site, mm. I believe, too. Been cylinders seen there in the 90s. Mm. And people have seen um, uh, UFOs disappearing into some of these ranges, some of these the ranges around here, mm -hmm. um, like you were saying before, happens where you are. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm sure you have some bases here, some underground. Mm. I know Mount Buffalo has an underground facility there that's, mm. that's a benevolent one. Mm. Yeah, we looked into that. Mm. There's uh, where there's so much going on. I, I think the thing that's blown my mind the most was the um, the Gosford Glyphs. Mm. I don't know if you've been out there. And haven't had, them. haven't seen them face to face oh, yet. It's, yeah. it's, it's a mind blower. You sit there and there's all these Egyptian glyphs and then looks like other world or Pleiadian glyphs on the other side with UFOs, everything mm. in them. Mm. And it's all been, you know, dated and, and mm. everything. And, it's, and how far does that go back? I don't know. It's um, beginning of um, Aboriginal civilization on in Australia, yeah, a long yeah. time, you know. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. We're not, we're not quite, quite sure. Like some people have dated back. I think you know, even said the Egyptian ones maybe three and a half thousand. Some have said seven and a half thousand. And now, as we go into the evidence, you know, to see how long the original people have been here, you know, some are even surmising now back to four hundred fifty thousand years. But they need some more testing to be done. So that's mm. just blowing. Everything out of the and world. that goes back to the Anunnaki coming here 450,000 mm. years ago. Mm. So yeah, I don't know whether it actually go that. My my opinion probably wouldn't go back that far. Yeah, because yeah. the sandstone blue mountains uh, they were created 400 to 400 million years ago. How many did you say? Oh, 450,000. Oh, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, yeah, that's. No, you, yeah, you've that's got to. Um, right. yeah. You sort of got to see the glyphs to to mm. believe it. I yeah. think because all you know you just yeah. don't know until you go and see it, mm. but. But uh, we're talking to the strongest as well. It's all, like they're finding uh, Aboriginal people on almost all continents now going back, mm -hmm. you know, tens of thousands of years. There was even photos going recently up to the last hundred years, like, oh, you know, maybe 50 years or something. Uh, one last person left in the tribe in Japan, mm -hmm. and they're full-blown Aboriginal, but they're in Japan, and they've mm -hmm. always been there. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. uh, the same with India and Africa, so... Yeah, it's a, a southern point of... South Africa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and they're blowing the out of uh, Africa theory out of the water now, and you know it's all come from Australia. And I think there was two mm. offshoots, one to Asia, one to Africa. But in South America, you're taught that you come from Australia. Mm. You know, mm. yeah, mm. that's what you taught at school. I think it was in Peru. They said yeah. or Ecuador. Wow. So it's it's funny that um, you know, all these things you tied all together is it's just you know goes into consciousness mm. and, and education. That's going to mess up the Smithsonian again because, you know, they just got a huge lawsuit against them and they lost about covering up all the giants, the giant uh, yeah, skeletons yeah. and everything. Mm. They destroyed them and got rid of them because they didn't fit the standard, yeah. you know, evolutionary pattern. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that was so. good thinking, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, I always said for her, if you want to find out what's really going on, go to the catacombs underneath the Vatican and the Smithsonian and, and you'll, you'll know what really happened because all the stuff is stored away or some of it's yeah. been destroyed unfortunately but yeah. mm -hmm. you know, even the um uh, God, what's that uh island where they have the giants east oh. Easter island yeah mm -hmm. well that those had tablets at the bottom of them mm -hmm. and there's these huge tablets and the tablets told all about that person who he was mm -hmm. his abilities how you know basically how they ascended and, and everything 
It was very powerful, uh, and all those tablets were either broken and thrown in the sea, or mm. some of them went back to the Smithsonian or hiding there. So, like the Spanish when they went through South America, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thing, yeah. destroyed it all. Yeah, yeah, anything that didn't align with the church mm. or with the standard the story, mm. which is really sad. But it's coming out anyway. It seems like you know that they, they never get everything. You know, nah. somebody comes across something and. And then they all scramble to hide it. And they, now they've had the internet, it gets blasted out like right away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I the, the glyphs, though, the, just the energy there, it, it's like when you're sitting there in front of that rock looking at those glyphs and everything else, you feel an energy there and you just, it's this aha button goes off mm, yeah. when you're standing mm. there. And I just said, wow, you know, this is all true. You know, this mm. is all real. And here it is in stone, you know, mm. and it's dated and everything else. So it was covered with a rock roof for yeah. many, many years, so they're protected from weathering, so yeah. that was yeah. a good thing, but it's, uh, over time it's fallen down a little, so. Yeah, yeah. But it's just, it, it, it just it's, it's one of, you, you have one of those big aha moments, mm. you know, when you, when you do that. And I know we're going to have, um, coming up soon, we're going to have uh, the Strongs on the show, and, mm. and uh, get Peter on there too to, to mm. do a long distance one when I get back yeah, to the States. Interesting study they're doing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And get yeah. that information mm. on. And they've written that great book, Ancient Aliens. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no. Uh, um, Ancient Aliens in Australia. Australia. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ancient Aliens in Australia. And they've just brought out another one called Between a Rock and a Hard Place. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. So I've got to talk to him. Well, I'm going to see him on the way home um, yeah. and find out a bit more about that. But it's just... Uh, there's lots of correlating evidence, you know, science mm. coming into it mm. as much as they can bring it into it, because I know that we can't test rock, that, you know, we can't mm. date it, date. but, you know, you've got to look at the surrounding areas mm. and, and, you know, really do an investigation. I think that's what they're, they're bringing yeah. to it as well. Yeah. You know, a lot of the carbon testing, dating, um, it doesn't take into the fact that back in the days of Atlantis and Lemuria, there's a total cloud cover over the Earth and the sun didn't really hit the earth like it did before and so it throws off a lot of things are much much older than than they think because they're going they're dating it by the you know the, the sun and things like the sun hitting things and it's de de com com what is it? decomposing rate or decomposition rate or whatever yeah. my brain's farting but <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> it's kind of funny but uh, I know things are like the like the pyramids and the Sphinx you know they found out it's much much older mm -hmm. than, yeah, yeah, it was whole, than yeah. they said and, and all the, the other scientists are angry and mm -hmm. you know I, I talked to this guy and he was uh, an Egyptian and some people you know he's like a king over there of, of several tribes and and I mentioned something to him about the aliens building the pyramids. Boy, he just came on glued. And, you know, we mm. built the pyramids. Yeah. You know, and, they and I said, well, you are the aliens. I said, the Earth's yeah. been colonized, you know. Yeah. You know they said, same, it doesn't matter, you know, still aliens built it. You know, yeah, because they had to. Yeah. yeah. We've probably had many civilizations rise and fall on planet Earth. Mm. Many, yeah. many. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it does, there is a series, if you get into the, the real history, and, and it's still expanding right now, is that um, they're finding gold ornate chains and like spark plugs and diodes and things like that mm -hmm. and they're dating uh, humanity back to 650 million years <laughs> with advanced uh, technology or the ability to make these golden chains and all these other things you know that's that's not a that's not a caveman with an axe you know mm -hmm. <laughs> and something like they're doing ornate jewelry back mm -hmm. then and, and uh, these coal mines you know they're pulling that lumps of coal with stuff in them mm -hmm. yeah. and things like that. So, you know, our history goes way back, you know, much further. And, you know, they have trilobites that are smashed with blueprints, you mm -hmm. know, so it goes back to the original, mm -hmm. you know, the original first life here on the planet. There was, there was you know, somebody here checking it out. And well, observing yeah, visitors, it. maybe. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Our understanding of everything is going back, uh, is going through a huge um, reassessment and I think, for me, it's been really interesting the uh, the new field of uh, the study of extremophiles, where you're studying life forms that can live in places that we thought they never could exist. Yeah. You know, yeah. In extremely um, hot environments, radiated environments, um, in you know, in places that you think life just can't exist there. And I think mm. back to the days of the early contactees in the 50s and 60s. And they'd be talking about life on um, other planets in our own solar system, mm -hmm. and our scientists were saying, "That's impossible. That mm. can't happen. You know, you're 
your charlatans, your fools, your this, your that. And now we're sort of back at that that, that point mm -hmm. where we're saying, well, yeah, maybe life can exist on Jupiter or yeah. uh, even yeah. on the sun. You know, yeah. we don't we don't really know. We don't know. Yeah. Yeah. The universe is obviously full of life in patches. Mm. Mm. Life everywhere. I, I have a photograph I'm going to show in my presentation this afternoon. And it's a photograph of the sun with the light beam. It's undeniable sitting there right in the sun. Mm. And it shows his face and it's everything. And it's like, you know, you know, because, you know, we think it has to be physical mm. to live on the sun. Well, mm. a light being could live on the sun, mm. no problem. It, mm. it, would, it wouldn't affect it, you know. Mm. So that's, we just have to get out of our box on how, mm. how life, you know, has to be mm. or it has to be physical or it has to be uh, yeah. the same as us. Well, know? that's one thing I'm quite amazing about the UFO subject and all the offshoots from it. It makes the mind think about all these possibilities and mm -hmm. it, it takes it expands the mind beyond what we would do, do normally if we weren't studying the subject. So uh, I think that uh, we add a bit of an advantage to those that aren't don't believe in UFOs or don't believe that aliens have been visiting Earth. Mm -hmm. They're losing or not being open to so much information which takes it beyond the subject and into subjects you were just talking yeah, about. Yeah. Mm. We also have strange things like time distortions and mm. even at the ranch the veils between worlds are very thin there because the two ley lines cross and it's a vortex and we're having pop-ins, you know, where things pop in just for a minute and then pop back out mm. again. The, the funniest one I saw and I was weeding the garden with this other woman was helping us and uh, I look over and I see this little, like a pygmy guy, you know, really small little guy walking by and he's got a little string around him and he's got his, and it looked like he had a, a spear and a something, I don't know what he had, like a wood wood on the side. I was more amazed at just looking at him when he, and he's walking by and he's just like smiling at us, you know, he walks by like this and then he goes, just disappears. Mm. Yeah. And I turn around and I go, did you see that? Mm. She goes, yeah. She goes, where'd that come from? Mm. Yeah, really. You know, and I, I don't know if, you know, maybe he's in the future or maybe he's in the ancient past or, yeah. or something, but there's, there's like a, a lot of time slips happening there and things like that. And Amazing. I think it's possible that life exists in, uh, at a subatomic level too, mm -hmm. from our understanding. Yeah. So they can... That might even explain a pop in. They somehow yeah. pop into this, uh, yeah. you know, to the uh, the above atomic subatomic level and um, yeah. into this reality and then disappear again. I mean, we, we just don't know. It's really yeah. about it's really about making room in our own minds for these concepts to exist, isn't it? it and is. even me, like I've I've been doing this for a long time. All you have too, and it's like um, I'm still have to when I hear people's stories. I still have to say not let my mind close down yeah, you know, yeah. I've got to still say no open it up listen to what they're saying listen to the whole story you know yeah. yeah well you know what's really helped me with that is that imagination is real on the level of imagination mm. so in the world of thought and you know things manifest instantly whatever you're thinking so mm. so I, I got to the point well what's not real you know mm. if, if that person believes that that's real for them, that that's their reality. Mm. Who am I to say, say no to that? Mm. It may not be my reality or it might not add mm. up with my program here in the physical, but still, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, and, and I see some people, there's so many different reasons for stories, you know, some people have legitimate stories and saw things and then there's some people that might have something a little, like a chemical imbalance or mm. things like that and they're mm. like popping into other, having seen all kinds of things that we mm. can Mm. What, what, yeah. what about the little little native you were just talking about? Just yeah. say he was uh, chewing some sort of little special tobacco from a bush somewhere. Yeah, yeah. And, and he and he gets this moment in time where he sees the future. Yeah. He goes back to his tribe and says, "Hey, man, you just should have seen what I saw." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Think about it from his perspective. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. When we were kids, we we uh, it was kind of interesting. But when we were kids, we. We caught these big chuckawallas. They're big lizards and they're they're non-poisonous lizards. But we actually made a little harness and we put one on a kite and we flew him way up there. You know, we we're gonna, he was going to be the first chuckawalla astronaut. <laughs> and we brought him back and we let him go. You know, and, and so it's just like you imagine him going back to there. Yeah. Ah, it's like way up there. You know, just looking yeah. down at you guys. They're going. Yeah. I was thinking about that. <laughs> so, so the poor guy, when he came down, he was all cold. Same thing, isn't it? Yeah. So, yeah. It's pretty mm -hmm. funny, but it's, it's all perspective, I think. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, 
I think basically we just have to master fear and be open mm -hmm. to other realities and, mm -hmm. and then things start happening. But if we, you know, it goes back to you see with your brain. Your mm -hmm. brain chooses what's in your reality and you have billions of bits, even in other dimensions, your eyes can see them, especially out the side vision, your cone, the cones pick up other dimensions. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, all our brain is choosing out of all that information what's useful to us or what's mm -hmm. going to be our reality. So. Mm -hmm. We have to change our reality or, or have, we always say you have to have pure intent, open mind, a loving mm -hmm. heart to, to expand to these things and have these contacts. And I think that's basically what it's all about. Is it's all about getting our consciousness in order, uh, you know, not be lifting somebody else for having experiences outside mm -hmm. our box. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. well, I, if I can go back to um, when I was seeing a lot of these uh, smaller objects at night, mm -hmm. Uh, that were buzzing me in all different directions. I had cam. I thought, well, I want to be able to film these. So I had cameras set up on either end of the, my yard, and um, I had a motorbike helmet with a night shot <laughs> camera on top here. Yeah. You know, no GoPros in them days, <laughs> and uh, a, a camera in my hand, ready to go. So I'm, if I can, my idea is, if I can see it, I'm going to film <laughs> it. Yeah. And they avoided me. They knew where they I had cameras. Going on, yeah. And I thought to myself, I'm imagining there's somebody up there on a spaceship got a little screen there and they got controls. Oh, let's play around with this guy, you know. Like, <laughs> as if they, they knew exactly what I wanted and they were avoiding me. And one night in particular, I had it all set, ready to go. A camera with a uh, big DSLR with an external flash ready yeah. to go. All I did is press the button. I thought, well, I'm determined to get something. Anyway, over the top of me, was this black shadow about the size of a car when it rooftop height? I went, oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know. So no matter how prepared, yeah, yeah, I yeah, know, yeah. It's yeah, not easy. Be ready. It's not easy. Bloody oh. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We're coming up to the end of the hour, um, so it's probably good. What's the best way for people to contact you to find out more about any events or, or uh, things happening here in Australia? They can go to our website, UFORQ dot asn dot au or they can go to our facebook page ufo research queensland okay so that's the best way to get in contact yeah and with peter you've got uh yeah it's peter maxwell slattery dot com and he said he and yeah facebook you can just type peter maxwell slattery and i think two or three pages will pop up as well so. yeah. yeah and then and then james Gillen on facebook or he said you can find out the latest events mm. and the best way to find out if you're listening to this in, in Australia, <laughs> you can uh, go to the uh, eSetiAustralia.org if you want to find out you know, where we're going to be speaking in the next upcoming events. But anyway, I can't thank you enough for all coming on the show. Thank and you. Uh, we've got to sign off. This is James Gillen with As You Wish Talk Radio signing off. Have a great evening. And Peter Slattery with his show as well because this will be a, uh, a shared broadcast. Cool.